Welcome back to the Strike First Gaming Show. I am your main host, Fo Song Elizabeth Cookie of Goddesses Media, and also the presenter of Mythological Moments. I'm followed by the CEO of Strike First Gaming himself, Cobra Kai Tone, who is going to let us know the latest and the greatest in the wonderful world of toy collecting and what's in his toy box. Cobra Tron, who is going to let us into his world of VR adventures. And our cosplay extraordinaire, Kitty Kaboom, who's going to share with us what is the latest in her world. And before we begin, I'm going to start off with what is the latest in our news category. News (laughs) flash. So this is what we got going on for today. So let's see here. And there we go. So. Latest going on here, we play esports and boxer, a Ukrainian undisputed boxer, heavyweight champion Ola Sindur, um, teams up with We Play Esports to create a new martial arts gaming league known as We Play Ultimate Fighting League. They came together to try something new where they believe sponsoring real life martial artists from the Ultimate Fighting Championship League with martial arts and video gaming can create a cross merge and cross pollination of new content as fighters from real life play fighting video games and fantasy to bring forth cross pollination and new economic opportunity to those who wish to join the wonderful world of esports. They have announced this at the end of their Mortal Kombat 11 tournament, the Dragon Temple, in which this video right here showcases their announcement. You can find out more about this partnership um, on eSports. Here's the website right here, eSports to be at server.com. Nice, nice. Wonder oh, what yes. games are gonna be in uh wonder what games are gonna be all in that. Like it's gonna be like Smash. So for right now, from what I understand from this article, they're just doing Mortal Kombat 11. I wouldn't be surprised if they moved it on to Smash, to Street Fighter. But then again, what other fighters are coming from the Ultimate Fighting Championship? Will they also melt over with Dana White with UFC? Will we see UFC fighters playing fighting video games? Right now, we already have the attention of like Snoop Dogg and a couple of other um, rap artists that are into this sort of thing. And seeking Mm -hmm. help from the likes of Sonic Fox to mentor him to play Street Fighter or Mortal Kombat or even Dragon Ball Z at a high level. So it's Pretty definitely dope. definitely a market there. I think they're just going to play Pocket Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> Closet Pocket it, Fighter. It's just going to be Pocket or Puzzle Fighter. Just watch. This, that's what the, they're going to be serious about that one. Well, <laughs> we will, well, I guess we will see. But this is the first of its likeness right here. And more about this at the eSportsObserver.com. That's interesting. interesting. I'm very I, interested. I'm looking to forward to see what they do with that. I really am. Me too. I would like to see what other martial artists will get in on this. As you know, UFC and also Ultimate Fighting Championships, Pantheon of martial artists, usually stick within Aikido, Judo, wrestling, and mixed MMA. You hardly don't see anything outside of that. So I hope they get into maybe Brazilian capoeira, Chinese Kung Fu, Krav Maga. i like to see something different. And um, we'll see. Austin Creed from um, Up, Up, Down, Down, who's a, uh, what is he? He's a wrestler, if I remember correctly. He's also into esports and was there at the Mortal Kombat 11 reveal event last year. So mm-hmm. let's see where, where, this, where this goes. Moving forward, there's also, if anybody remembers the name Bleem from the 1990s CD that allowed you to play PlayStation 1 discs on your computer, The name has since become defunct and is bought out by a company named Pico that gears on using the Bleem name in order to move classic games onto Steam. So major companies like Nintendo, Squaresoft, Sega, uh, if they want to create a move their classic video games to the Steam platform, 
Pico will be their main company that they can go through to allow PC conversions and compilations of older games transferred through to the Steam platform while using Bleem as the main wrapper. You can find out more about this at PCGamesSN.com um, right here. And it goes more into Gleam as the name got bought out by the Pico company. Okay. And so far, these are the games that they also have published and put on Steam, Super 3D Noah's Ark, and 40 Winks. So I look forward to seeing what other game titles that they will be able to secure through Nintendo, Sega, EA Sports, uh, Nintendo, etc. cetera. Hmm. Okay, moving forward. So, um, I accredit the likes of this discovery to my technical advisor, Rob Miles, who posted in one of our forums that Riot lists Spotify as partner in New Deal. So, Riot Games is the overseer of League of Legends. We also have, a, I believe, not Half-Life, but uh, there's, another, there's another piece of game. I can't recall it right now, but it's just like League of Legends, and Riot is also in control of that game. League of Legends, as you know, is a major, major, major PC game all over the world. Makes I'm multi, biggest, multi million dollars. It's the biggest. Go on. Yeah, that's like the biggest thing. Like, it's great to rob the pull this news. This is probably one of the most game changing things in video games, like right now. This little mixture of music and video games, too. Like, mm -hmm. the two biggest entities. Let's go. I mean, let's face it, they go hand in hand. I mean, music and video games, how many of us gamers are always listening to background or OST music from these games? I mean, we have like a whole genre and pop culture about it already. So, I mean, it's great. It's finally happening now. And you're right. This is really huge for the well, for both industries. I'm glad yeah. it's happening now. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's finally happening. It's finally happening over here. You know, this is nothing new over in Asia. The League of Legends... Mm -hmm tournaments that happen in Asia, whether it be Taiwan, Singapore, Korea, um, parts of Japan, and even now parts of Shanghai, China, they go all out. They go super all out, not only with the cosplay, but with the gaming section, multi-billion dollar tournaments with multi-million dollar prizes. And before the games even event, they're treated like live events. There are performances, there's acrobatics, there's martial arts, there's mm -hmm. music, there's everything. It's a festival to even start the tournament. It's like uh, an opening ceremonies and a closing ceremonies before the tournament even begins. This like is one of the, the dragon. I, Just, it's enter the dragon straight up. Right. <laughs> and this is one of the things that I wanted to do for the martial arts gaming community or the fighting game community here in the States was to have those type of opening ceremonies with red bull athletes that do parkour free running martial arts but do it in the likeness to the favorite video gaming martial arts characters that we see on a professional level mm -hmm. hopefully one day my idea will be heard <laughs> but as of right now what i've been thinking about has already been done in all of asia they're like light years ahead of us so it's nice to see that this spotify riot um partnership has, is coming over here and it's happening here through League of Legends. So that's great. We'll see. They'll sure, guess. Cool. Mm -hmm. There'll be the, uh, the 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 capstone or the pioneers in you know showcasing how it needs to be done if you want a real big extravaganza, turning regular video game tournaments into an extravaganza. Okay, more about that. You can find on esportsbiz.com the partnership. This goes into the entire article right there. Moving forward. Okay, wanted to introduce some new news, which I thought was pretty cool for anyone interested in moving to Japan and wanting to buy property. So there is a big African-American and African and Latino diaspora that lives in Japan. And this video is known as the Black Experience Japan, which chronicles melanated individuals or people of color from all over the world that want to either get citizenship, find a job, create new roots in Asia. And this particular video here is how to buy property as a foreigner in Japan. 
which goes into a second video by a Japanese person here, Mr. Yamamoto Property Advisory of Tokyo. How can a foreigner for a num from another country buy property or real estate in Japan? So these videos here are on YouTube, of course, and it is very easy. It's a simple process. And the easy part is paying for the property and getting it. The hard part is realizing that now you are now subject to Japanese government to real estate taxes. Mm. And so not having a Japanese citizenship can be a little bit difficult. So unless you are a multimillionaire or unless you are living a well-to-do lifestyle here in America, then you may have a hard time paying those property taxes yearly abroad coming from another country. Easier when you have your citizenship, of course, because by that part, they assume you're speaking fluent Japanese. You have your, your Shuko card. You have all these different things of what it takes to become a Japanese citizen. And you can do that. Otherwise, living in the States, you would have to have a, an excellent job here while paying for Japanese taxes abroad because the Japanese, the Japanese government will find you. <laughs> <laughs> So and that's, then we'll throw you in a random hidden martial arts tournament, and then we're going anime episodes just so you could keep your property you bought. But that's a whole another story. <laughs> so, hmm, I got to think about that one. <laughs> but yes. So when do you guys want to all pitch in so we can get some property? I'm ready. I, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take the I'll take the corner. Eight feet by two feet, <laughs> you get the rest. Uh, um, property in Japan has got to be expensive. I mean, you know, I'm talking Tokyo. I know a lot of people live outside of Tokyo and uh, Yokohama and stuff like that because it's a little bit cheaper. But yeah, I want to explore outside of Tokyo to see what it's like outside of Tokyo because I know I looked at the prices. It, it's crazy for what they pay a month. It 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 depends. To to buy outright is very inexpensive, and this video here from this African-American dude that lives in Japan that bought the house. See, it's different in Japan. When you get the house, you also get the property with the house. And it's, oh. all, and it's all one set price. It's not separate. This is the easy part. This is why it's so easy because what comes afterwards hard, paying the yearly taxes. So unless you have a good job in America, you just may have some um, run into a caveat. But when you buy the property, it comes with the establishment on it all in one. So you could get a good piece of property between thirty-five dollars and $55,000, let's say, in Kyoto or outside in the countryside, and you do whatever the hell you want with it. Just as long as you're paying the Japanese government their cut once a year, you're good. You know? <laughs> so that's, and that's what this video here, the Black Experience, this particular video shows this guy, and he tells you, the step-by-step -step process, what he did to do what he did. And he's turning it into a bed and breakfast. And it seems like a wonderful business. I think it was genius. See, that's yeah. exactly where we stayed at Evo Japan. We did in Miami Senju, we did a Airbnb that was on the outskirts of, of Tokyo. And that's, that's how we got around because, and the house, I mean, it wasn't a big fancy house. It was a small size house, but it fit us all, which was good. And um, it, it was just on this small little property spot. And whoever owned that house was part of, it was the same house, but there was one on the left, one on the right, and one in the middle. And it was all one tiny little square property somebody owned and was like renting those out. We spoke to the neighbors next door and they told us that, yeah, we, we own this house and then this person bought this one and runs an Airbnb here and the same people behind us do the same thing because they were asking, you know, uh, where we were from and everything and how long we were staying and things like that. They were really nice and friendly, but I've heard homes are cheap, but I'm really curious to know about those uh, property taxes now. I'm definitely going to watch this later. This is That's very interesting. the main thing is those property taxes. You figure mm -hmm. that part out and get over that hump, then everything is smooth sailing. I might have to see what's up with this. So Thank you, for, Cookie. Yeah, no problem. So from what I understand, it's one fee once a year. So like in the States, we have school tax. We mm -hmm. have all these different separate taxes that come in the community tax. 
for having your house in a particular area. It's not like that in Japan. You have your mm-hmm. one fee once mm-hmm. a year. It's not all this crazy nonsense of all these different. Because remember, America is. Uh, uh, I wanted to say democracy. It's a uh, capitalistic, mm-hmm. capitalistic thinking. So everything is a fee, an assessment, an attachment. That's America. Japan, not so much that way. So, so that's what this video is. Now, I followed it up with a second video by a Japanese person, Japanese real estate advisor. He goes even more in depth on how you can go and purchase a property. And this is coming from Japanese lips and rather it's instead of just an African American person going through the process. Now, this comes from a Japanese person that owns a property corporation that does this as a living, selling properties to foreigners. Mm-hmm. So that's what Mr. Yamamoto does. So I say, take a look at that. A bit oh later. yeah! <laughs> ah, the light bulb. I can see the light bulb in your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, next, moving forward. So, I normally don't really talk about transgenders and video games, but this came up on my radar recently, which was the evolution of transgender characters within the world of Japanese anime but particularly fighting video games. And so they decided to highlight, this person who wrote the article decided to highlight Poison, who's been around since 1989 from the Final Fight game and his, her evolution. Depending on which game you play with Poison in it, Poison is seen seen or portrayed as a he, she, a female that still has woman parts. The, the, um, or now a full-fledged transgender that has gotten the full um, sexual transmuted surgery, uh, sexual reassignment surgery, uh, and it's, you can see that in like Street Fighter 4. But this, this article goes into what it's like for transgenders in the video game world to go through an evolution of being in the background to the foreground of the background and now to the forefront as one of the most popular characters that deals heavy damage in the Street Fighter universe. And Poison is an example, shining example of a successful transgender character that all of a sudden became popular. And for once, is not seen for the genitalia in between his, her legs. So excellently written article, for anyone that wants to know a little bit more about that, you can find that on techradar.com. They did a whole spread on Poison. It was an interesting read. Poison is not even my favorite character, but uh, I read it pretty cool. Another notable transgender character, believe it or not, and it's a boss character from Samurai Spirit 64, is Yuga the Destroyer. Yuga is both male and female and Mm -hmm. transforms willingly through sorcery as both entities. There's two parts you fight. I believe the slash form, the slash form is his female form, and the bust form is his male form. So just putting that out there. And last but not um, going forward, there's a lot of news I wanted to share today. The, the entire fiasco between GameStop and the, and the hedge fund scandal. Donks. <laughs> so. Animal Crossing stonks. <laughs> Making a long story short, a bunch of millennials in between the ages of 18 and 26 were meeting on Reddit. I had to write this down here on a group. The the group on Reddit still exists. And in fact, I'm going to do research on it later, known as Wall Street Bets. They were meeting on Wall Street Bets to plan hedge funds or something of the likening to bet on stocks that were falling. So everyone knows that GameStop stock was falling for a long time because people are buying their games digitally through the PlayStation Store, through Xbox Live, Microsoft, all of that. That's what we're giving towards more here in the US. But just like penny stocks, when you hype up a penny stock, it's reliant on people putting money into it because they believe that the stock is gonna rise up. So you, when you buy it when it's low, you get it at the low price, but as more people buy into it, it started to raise. And when it raised to a certain price, it may reach a cap and then bust. And if you catch it before it busts, you can cash out and make your money. Otherwise, if it busts, you may lose money. 
And that's exactly what happened to GameStop and two other stocks known as Express and AMC. They found a way to beat the system from older, experienced stockbrokers. And they managed to raise the stock of GameStop solely by meeting up on a Reddit Reddit forum and hyping it up for the world to see. If anyone's seen the movie The Big Short, just watch that movie, and that's pretty much what played out. Kind of yeah. like in reverse, though, because it's like a David and Goliath story. So the little guy is the guy who won this time. So it's actually better than The Big Short. Mm-hmm. No, I have not seen that movie, so I will put it in my list of things to watch. Cool. All right. So anybody wants to know more about that, they could just Google. They don't even have to go to Yahoo Finance. They could just Google that. And it's all over. You know, mm-hmm. it's been the talk of the talk of the town for the night for the last three, four days. And it's still going. Mm-hmm. Yep. And in fact, a little kid, a little kid who's like seven years old for his birthday, um, mother bought him ten dollars worth in GameStop stocks mm-hmm. when it was like two seventy something. He made five thousand dollars. And of course, to a kid when you're seven, five thousand dollars is like one million. So it's like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so good for him good for that kid and then last but not least I credit this to Dr. B Galaxy B who wanted to share the creation of the rap music and all of the elements that went into the creation of Street Fighter 3 so this is a video I saw quite some time ago um, it's nothing new but they did they did an update to the video and the update of this video is great because it goes into the rap artist who was selected by Capcom to do all of the voiceovers for the round one fight, who did several rap songs, the opening rap song, the infinite song for Street Fighter 3, as well as the character select music. All of that was his voice, all of that was his crew, and is and it's great. And this is just the interview of Infinite going into what it meant to do music for Street Fighter, how he was selected in the process by Capcom, and how everything that he has done lives on 20-something years later. It is still a masterpiece. What he did was a masterpiece and ends up being one of the greatest opus creations in martial arts gaming history. And he's the creator of that for the music that Capcom chose themselves of Japan, no less. Mm-hmm. So congrats to Infinite for his success all these years later. So that concludes our news session. We're gonna move forward with you, Cobatron. What's going on with your VR adventures? Oh, with the VR? I got a couple of little goodies in the mail the past week. I picked up a couple of little more lighthouse. These things, post these things in the corner of your room. A lot of uh, motors inside that spin and they shoot light and they talk to each other from across the room and anything from in between gets captured in space in VR. So got these for my little studio setup. And with that, you can track these things right here. The uh, I showed you these before, the Knuckles controllers. These things are amazing. They like kind of just slip on your hand so you don't have to actually hold it. You could. And when you do hold it, it has like a sensor inside here that knows you're squeezing it. And I think it like kind of can even if you can, if you squeeze it hella hard, it'll know you're squeezing hella hard. So certain things might have to happen for you to use that. And then uh, basically I got these things too, the vibe trackers. These things are for what you would call V tubing, VR tubing which is people going into social media sites like YouTube and Twitch and basically representing themselves as like an avatar of some sort. Mm -hmm. So you can go into like a VR chat or you could even dance and beat saber and you can literally be anything you want, like, like a zombie or a monster or a furry or your favorite anime character. You could be Goku. And with these things, you strap one of these on each of your feet. So this controls all your leg movements with reverse kinetics. So it knows like your bone structure, which ways your uh, feet are pointed. And and then you put one of these on your waist and it pretty much controls your whole center of gravity. So you can literally do 
almost everything that you would be able to do in real life in VR. So if you wanted to do like a handstand or if you wanted to like hop on a stripper pole and spin around, you would literally <laughs> be in VR, VR chat spinning around on a, either a, a virtual <laughs> stripper pole or no stripper pole at all. And so that's what I got going on right now. I'm uh, investigating this, the company uh, <laughs> track belt. These things will uh, strap these things on tight to your body. So you keep it like nice and nice and snug. And then uh, basically after that, all you do is go into your favorite avatar maker and you could create whatever you want, or you could download someone else's creation. So like I say, you could be Goku or, or a furry lots of furries or you could be like some weird blob or something or uh you could be like dracula or i think i'm gonna go on there as the black hulk hogan and just go <laughs> hey brother and just run around doing that and just like be like a virtual fighter character or something like that and nice there's a lot of weird stuff on vr chat to keep it PG, there's like everything under the sun. So you could have like a hot dog with someone's hot dog hanging out. So it's Uganda stuff like knuckles. that. <laughs> you have an army and, of Uganda knuckles. Yeah, like the knuckles and all the Randy Macho Man Savage mm -hmm. meme stuff. It's mm -hmm. pretty crazy in there. So it's 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 pretty much like the Wild West. But once you get in there and you figure out what you're going to do, it's, it's kind of fun. So I'm probably going to be a... Uh, broadcasting some of that stuff starting this week so check nice. us out on team strike first twitch and we'll be playing some of that exploring all the weird stuff there is to be had there uh, other than that uh yeah just trying to build my studio out for vr for all occasions whether it's wireless with the quest 2 or wired and with the uh the valve index which i just got i showed you guys last week and and also the 8kx which i got a while back and that thing is crazy too so be showing you all the different actualities with VR and all that stuff. So, yep, check me out. Nice. I can't nice. wait to see the the live uh, VR chats and you running around in there. I'm looking oh, forward yeah. to that one. We'll get, we'll get some Feet Saber in there. You know, strap these things to your feet <laughs> and all of a sudden Beat Saber becomes Feet Saber. And it's like pretty much DDR and virtual reality. It's like the craziest thing. Uh, a lot of people in Asia are doing that, doing that crazy, but is I'm trying to bring it back for America and all the DDR heads out here, like a like a revival, nice. DDR freak revival. Let me know if uh, you ever see anybody doing pata pata in VR. I'll be there. I know Cookie and I will be there. Just just let us know. Well, I'll I'll ask you what I need. I have you just like order me some stuff. We will just jump in there with you. We'll yep. just have our own pata pata dance party. Yep, let's do it. We could just have our own little VR parties all day, every day. Just like, yes, that's, that's the thing right now during all the, during the quarantine, during the mm -hmm. pandemic. So, cool. If you find it, let me know. I'll be there. So, how much were those devices? Were those expensive devices to add to your uh, to your studio? Yeah, the Vibe Tracker goes for about. I mean, if you go on eBay, you can find them kind of cheap. Uh, the Lighthouses, these are the one point zeros. Uh, the 2.0s are out. I would say get those. They're a little more expensive. They're just new technology. All they really do is allow to be further apart. So if you wanted to have some of these in a, in a warehouse and really have like a bunch of people all playing, uh, if you want to set up your own enterprise, you could use uh, you could use these still. These don't want to be too far apart, maybe a, a living room apart. But the 2.0s, yeah, you could fill up like a warehouse with those and then you have a bunch of people playing. Uh, uh population or just all the vr multiplayer games and it'd be kind of crazy to kind of see that like we might have to set something up like that like just let people play like who knows man and what's the, the what's the cost on endless. those ones how much are those how much are those that you these have? ones are uh, i got these for 65 on ebay and okay, that's okay. a really good price because if you buy these straight from uh htc they mm -hmm. probably want 115 to 130 each mm -hmm. just because of the shortage and uh, the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. But if you look around and you're patient and, and befriend some sellers, you might be able to get one of these for like $65. They work perfect. Cool. And how much was the belt? The belts are like, you could probably get the whole, the waist and both the ankle things, uh, the feet things. Though You could get the whole thing for like $49.95 on eBay or Amazon. Uh -huh. 
Oh, okay. Not tra bad. Track belts. There's like maybe one or two other brands, but they all do the same thing. You just basically don't want it to move too much because once it starts like jittering, then mm -hmm. like in the game, your hip starts like shaking like this. Like, <laughs> you don't want and then, also, I've seen cases of where someone's ankles end up over someone's ass and it's like it's like some weird uh, crap type thing. It's creepy as hell. So you want to make sure the uh, pucks are both. They call them a puck because they look when you look at it, it looks like a hockey puck. OK, but, uh, yeah, but it's the tracker and you want to make sure both of these things can mm -hmm. see it. And that might be like you bought it if you're a, if you're a YouTuber, you might have like a bunch of uh, cameras or lights sitting in the way you might have to like back them up a little bit there's a whole little rigmarole that you have with trying to get this thing in order and like trying to get it like calibrated to your situation because everyone's different everyone has different like areas for their living room or a playroom so you basically want to just make sure these things see each other and you won't have like your ankles over your ass type situations <laughs> nice good to know well thank you thank you for letting us know what's the latest into your vr adventure Moving forward, all right, Cobra Cartoon, what do you have going on with your toy collection? All right, everybody. Today, I'm digging into something that actually one of the first toys I started collecting in the first few years ago that got me back into toy collecting. I'm um, just following the steps of my brother, Cobratron, over there. But So uh, I went to Japan, and uh, I went to Kitty Land over in Harajuku, and I found Batman Ninja. And, you know, I'm thinking, you know, I'm in Japan, you know, they have a Batman with a ninja. It's just, a, you know, a, a culture across. It's actually uh, anime that came out. So I started digging in and uh, 2018, they dropped uh, Batman Ninja. So uh, it was uh, Masato Hisa. He's the, he's the one that's overseeing the storyline. And it's in conjunction with Warner Brothers and DC Comics. It's really cool. I've seen it maybe like a couple months ago. Very fluid, very fun anime. Uh, you get the personalities from all your characters. Uh, everyone's in there. You got Joker, you got your uh, Harley Quinn, you got your Catwoman, uh, Gorilla Grove. Everyone's in there. Um, so just a background of the story. Um, Gorilla Grove has a time machine, and they're fighting in Arkham. Uh, excuse me, in Arkham. So what happens is, Batman gets caught up in the uh, time machine. So does Catwoman and everyone else in the scene. Joker's already been caught up in the time machine and he is the Lord of Future Japan. And he is like, uh, he's like, who's that guy in Robin Hood? Uh, uh, the Sheriff of Nottingham. He's like that, you know what I mean? He's just so evil. So it's very cool. You get the personality of him. Um, you get Two-Face, you get the Riddler, you get Bane as a, uh, as a sumo wrestler, so it's a very fun crossover, and the animation is perfect. I love. Is it. Poison Ivy in there somewhere? Yes, yes. <laughs> is she Ivy. a geisha or something? <laughs> I actually, you know what? I got to watch it again. It was so much going on. I really only watched it once. I'm gonna actually watch it again. Uh, it's very fun. I, I just started digging into other animes that are crossovers from like Marvel, so definitely gonna be watching this again. So I brought you a few of these. Uh, items that I've collected ever since I've got my first figure. And the first thing is I got the manga books from Japan. Yes, yes. It is a two volume. Oh, let me see. Make sure I got that right. Yes. Front to back. There you go. Yep. It comes with a t-shirt. I have the t-shirt for this one. I could not catch the t-shirt for this one. These are kind of hard to find. I had to get these on eBay. Uh, you can't find this in the U.S. If you can, grab it because I have to pay $20, $25 shipping from each book from different sellers. So just on the shipping alone, I paid $50 for this. You got to go um, to those things that Cookie and, and Kitty go to, a little book, those book things. That's where you <laughs> find thoughts. them. Yeah, I know. I, I'm gonna, yeah, you guys got to guide me through this because, yeah, this was very expensive, but very worth it to have. And I'm glad to have it in uh, so, uh, my selection and collection. Mm. This is the T-shirt from the volume one. I nice. cannot get volume two brand new and get the t-shirt. I'm on a hunt for that. So Ooh. I wish I could speak uh, Japanese and uh, read Katakana. I'd be able to read it, but it's very nice. So let me dig Don't into feel that. bad. I, I, can't, I can't read Japanese either. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even the smartest, kids, the smartest kids in my high school failed Japanese. So yeah, I won't take it personal. Oh, All right. 
And then now we have SH Figure Arts. SH Figure Arts came out with their Batman Ninja line. We yep. have the Batman and we have the Joker. Very beautiful, very detailed, very nice articulate pieces. These things are nice. It's not as articulate as the other figures I'm going to show you, but for the price point, these are cheaper. These were actually for the Batman for 105 Comes with the sword, sword sheath, comes with the uh, kunai as a uh, second face plate, as you can see there. Very nice, has a, uh, a cape, it's not cloth. Um, the head articulation isn't all that, but body posing is very dope. The Joker is nice, as you can see, he is, you get the glare off there. Very beautiful. He is an evil lord, as you can see. He's got his nice bands and everything. So, I love these, uh, very affordable, uh, not too over the head price where you cannot afford to get it in your collection. Um, these are still available. You can catch these on like Big Bad Toy Store. Mm -hmm. um, I actually uh, got the Joker is you're gonna catch that aftermarket for 75. It will not, you will not catch that uh, retail anymore. That one is not available. These things came out in 2018. Um, so we're gonna switch on over to Figma. And this is the actual first figure that I have collected that put me into this realm of Batman Ninja. So he has two versions. This is Figma 395. This is the regular version. Um, he comes with the kunais, and he comes with the throwing effects. Very Ooh. beautiful cape. Very detailed. Articulation is through the roof. As you can see right there, you can pose all the way down and get your knees into the dirt and stuff like that. Comes with one sword. Uh, comes with a second faceplate also. And this one was for $100. You can catch this right now, aftermarket for $100, or maybe retail. I'm not sure. I have to double check that one. And then you have the big brother to that, which is also Figma. You got the Figma EX. This number is 53. Very nice. Comes a little bit bigger box, but they are the same height, six inches. This is a 112. So he uh, comes with an extra cape, which is cloth. He comes with the extra uh, samurai armor. You got the leg plates, the arm plates, the shoulder plates. The, uh, attach, the attachment to the uh, helmet, uh, second faceplate, and the second sword. That's really cool, you know what I mean? He has two swords, and you know what I mean? You got that Musashi style going on. So from there, we get to something that is not quite affordable. Oh, actually, let me see. The DX for that Figma, that one was 149 which what I bought it for. It is now 189 aftermarket. You cannot find that retail anymore. If you can, get it. Oh, wow. This one is the one. This is from Star Ace. It's a 1.6. This is the war version. So it comes just like that uh, That DX, uh, uh, the EX version of Figma, the Sengoku version. It has the samurai armor. It just shows him as the ninja form right here. But as you can see, he has the full-fledged samurai armor. 1.6, full articulation. This thing is bad. You know, for 1.6, for this price, it's just price that. 289. Um, the regular one, 239, but it's worth it just to get the upgraded with all the extra armor and you know Hell yeah. this thing, yeah, this thing is bad. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into until I got it. I thought it was a statue, and I'm like, oh, cool statue. This thing is bad. One six. This is uh, I would say at the point of integrity and quality of hot toys, mm -hmm. and that is a cloth cape. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Beautiful. They uh, that is my Batman Ninja. I need to get the animated DVD on Blu-ray. I watch it on digital, but I need to get it for my collection. That thing is, it's a fun cartoon, fun story to get into, get into the collectibles. They even have bigger and better things than what I showed you. Uh, Prime One Studio has has a, a, a Batman Ninja's uh, statue. And they have a Joker statue, but they are priced mm -hmm. high. Those are around like eight, nine hundred dollars. If you know about Prime Studio One, they don't do big amounts uh, in production. So if they come out with something as far as like a statue, you might see about five hundred to a thousand, at least or less. Now, um, are those are those the figures where they're on the roof? Yes, those ones. Yep, you know what I'm talking about. I you know, know what, what you're about. talking about because first of all, when the movie came out, I was hyped. I could. It, it's an absolute gorgeous masterpiece in its own um the the character design the costume design for the characters they they did their homework and 
and they followed, you know, Japanese history with the clothing. And you can tell that when you're watching the anime and then in a lot of those figures like Tone has, and especially the one we're talking about now on the roof, like that company did a phenomenal job bringing those figures to life. They're really beautiful. Oh, yeah. And the the, uh, the character designer is actually Afro Samurai's Takashi mm. Okazaki. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, very beautiful. Um, I thought it was going to kind of be a fluff piece. You know what I'm thinking? You know, there's real hardcore anime out there and, you know, crossover from America. But they really they really brought it uh, brought it to life. Uh, when mm-hmm. Batman gets in the future of Japan, you know, the setting has changed. It's like yep. they, they did. They did their homework. I definitely got to take some time to look at the, the animation. I remember it being online. I was able to see the release of it on Amazon. Mm-hmm. But I know DC now has its own channel. So most of the DC movies between 2016 up to now are all released on their channel. And you can see everything Justice League the new Wonder Woman movie, animated movies, all of that, including not only the Batman Ninja, but also I believe there's now a Batman goes into like the Sherlock Holmes era. There's a movie on that, like Mm -hmm. Batman as Sherlock Holmes or something. They did a couple of crossovers with Batman in different universes where he's the same entity, but playing a different role, but still Batman. The Ninja is just one of several other genres that they did with Batman and they played with the timeline and I thought it was pretty cool to take a different take on it. The latest thing I actually saw in relation was the Harley Quinn, the Harley Quinn team up. I forget the movie Harley Quinn teams up with Batman to stop Poison Ivy from infecting the world. There was a movie that was on um, DC, which was pretty cute. It was a cute movie. So Is that where uh, Harley Quinn falls in love with Batman? No, she falls in love with uh, Robin, and in that that in that animated movie, they end up having sex. <laughs> oh, I heard about that one. And okay, Batman, I know what you're talking about now. Batman walks in on the action. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, the the expression, the way that the way, but they, <laughs> I'm tongue tied. <laughs> the way they went, <laughs> that's how crazy it was. <laughs> Batman's expression. <laughs> Batman's expression on walking in on the sex play between Robin, who's now Nightwing, and Harley Quinzel is is timeless. The way they was able to animate that. Yeah. And then she walks out and I remember Harley Quinn says some type of snazzy line like, well, you know, it was fun. But guess what? I'll call you when my when my dildo runs out of battery. You know, so it's, <laughs> this is her. There, when she, there were many memes and comics after that animated uh, movie. Uh, so yeah, the, you, you can find it out there. And I'm not going to spoil it for anyone. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's the extent of my spoiler, but it, it was, it was good. It was funny. It was cute. This is her after she gave up a life of crime. Mm-hmm. Mm. Seeing that uh, he's doing a lot of animation and stuff, I think, uh, Batman needs to come back and do a a, a mech warrior kind of uh, kind of production thing going on. You know, he's always in some type of nice, you know, flying machine or motorcycle or Batmobile. It would be dope to see a Batmobile mech fighter and have a cartoon based around that. That would be cool. I'd buy that toy. I mean, I'd they like already did it with Hello. Just Kitty gave up the million dollar it. idea, man. Just keep that keep that <laughs> under wraps. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing what was the latest in your toy box. We look forward to the next episode, seeing what you pull out of your chest. Okay. All right, Kitty, what do you have going on? All right. So with my segment, it's all about um, inside joke I'm going to let you in on. I call it C Sports. And the C is for Crane Games. Because let's face it, I'm dying to go back to Japan. We're all dying to go back to Japan. I am just like, I can't tell you besides the cravings for all the yummy food out there and just going back into the arcades, being able to play some UFO machines and a whole bunch of other gotchas and every other game. So I have now been addicted to Toraba. Now I know Toraba has been out for a while. 
but I was a little bit um, skeptical at first, you know, can you really win? Are these going to be like the American crane games and you're going to get gypped a lot or do you actually have a fair chance? So here's just some of the cool stuff you could get and people are sleeping on this. And especially with us being, you know, SNK King of Fighter fans, uh, you get some gold which um, the King of Fighters 98 plushies, including um, not only Kyo Chizuru, but there was also an Iori. And the games are actually very decently priced. They start from like $1.50 to $1.80. Most expensive crane game that they have on this site, on this app is $2.50. So it's really up to you to pick and choose throughout what you want. And the great thing is, is not only do they have the regular plushies and figures that, you know, weebs and otakus always want to get, but you have some really cool everyday stuff here too, such as an air mattress, a taiyaki maker. <laughs> hell, um, hell, like stuff at the uh, uh, yeah. dollar store, house dollar store. Um, I wouldn't say <laughs> it's a dollar store, but like a few steps up because it's actually nice products. You can get specialty sneakers, cross collab sneakers, you can get your cat a new litter box if you feel like it. And then grab yourself a Dragon Ball figure, too, while you're at it. But um, right now, there's lots of Kimitsu no Yaiba. There's lots of Jujutsu Kaisen. Um, I've unfortunately failed at the Jujutsu Kaisen ones. I really was hoping to uh, get some Gojo plushies, and those went really fast. So here's the thing. Download the app. They give you one free play every day. Um, you know, add a few bucks. And I know it gets really hard just to limit yourself. But trust me, if you say I'm only going to try like five bucks during the week, not so bad. Because what you can do is you could stake out games like you see right now. I love the Blue Ham Hams. The creator is on Twitter. You can follow Blue Ham Ham on Twitter. That's the original one. And I can't get this plush anywhere in the States. So the fact that I could play this game, get lucky, like you're about to see right there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and and I love the strategies behind this. Mm -hmm. Because not only will I be sitting watching, doing commentary live on my um, Instagram or on Twitch for this as a joke, but it actually has some hype moments. And this yeah. is one where you get to start learning the techniques of pushing, pooling, some people will even double stack the prizes so mm -hmm. it becomes heavier, and then they, boom, they win two prizes instead of one. And it's so great to see everybody lining up in the queue waiting to play after you. And the videos that you're seeing right now are actually from the wins that I have had on this uh, during Toraba Crane Games, which is nice. really great. So... Trust me, all of these videos were not just one takes. There was only one time that <laughs> I had a good one. I'm going to be honest with you. There was one time where somebody, and this happens a lot, people get frustrated after putting, you know, 10, 20 bucks in, and then they're done or they're out of money and you're next in line. And then you just get to, you know, just feed off that win. So, like here with Inosuke, that's kind of what happened. The person set it up, couldn't do it, and boop, there you go. And so that was a good, that was, I think that happened in like two or three. I'll be honest with you. you but got more um, skill than them. Well, I mean, Definitely. got that, got that JDM training, you know, being in Japan. That's all it is, it's skill. They had, they had, this, <laughs> their skill was to leave early. Your skill was to like <laughs> capitalize on theirs. Hey, just like when we're playing fighting games, you got to have a bit of patience, right? Right. Yep. So that's all it is. Yeah, the only ones I got successful with, I got the uh I got like a, a Joe Cool Snoopy. That's the uh the mini one. Yeah, it's not even like yeah, it, it's the only time I got lucky in one of those games, but it was fun doing it. And it was fun because I did it within my second try. I was like, yeah. Those are the best feelings ever. Just um being able to win a brawly for two dollars when they normally go for like twenty five uh, um here in the States when you see them at conventions. Because I got a couple of $1 and $2 figures from Japan. So I'm really happy about those. But I want to show you guys. Basically what happens is you can either do a monthly subscription, which gives you extra plays, which is pretty cool. 
But if you don't do that, what happens is after you win your prizes, you get um, free shipping every week. So I've won some prizes over the last few weeks. I've waited to gather them all together and make sure they come all together at once. And that way, you know, the shipping is free instead of waiting, waiting, and then having to pay and do all that back and forth. So like I said, it, it pays to be patient with these, but your prizes yeah. do come. They they always come uh, nice and safe. <laughs> <laughs> Little cheese I know, me I'm trying I've tried to contain it. myself. Like, <laughs> why do you have that? And I don't. <laughs> Trust me, I was trying to get all three. And it's What's the crazy. third one? Iori. Mm. Oh, of course. Of course, you know. Iori's you, everywhere. You, you got mom and you got her just like Benny. In KOF 15, babysitting the two, you know, troublemaking kids. So it's the same thing. So they're always hair down, together. Hair down, Plus, Benny. So basically, mm-hmm. they gave you they they gave you the peacekeeper, the sword, and the orb. Yes. Okay. And this these were actually not selling because people didn't discover them when they first came out. When they first came out, I didn't even know they were on there. I got lucky, and the past few weeks, I've been trying to win all of them. I'm not going to tell you how much this one cost. In the SNK win. store? No, they, you can't even get these at the SNK store. These were mm. only, these were uh, made for a company just for Toraba. So this isn't even an mm. SNK product that you could get limited, at the Akiba container store or anything. So it always pays to have your eye out, just check like daily or once a week on Toraba because you do get gems like this. And she's a decent size plush. So I don't know how many Kimitsu no Yaiba fans there are, but this was also that Giyu that was one. And wow. he's precious. Look at this frumpy wow, little. Oh, that's boy. nice. Isn't he cute? Here's a nice close up. <laughs> so what I do Sick. remember, the crane game you're talking about, the Toraba, as well as other crane games, are, they're all over Japan, but some of the rare ones was at the Warehouse Arcade in Kawasaki. Mm. So from what I understand, that famous warehouse, that abandoned warehouse that was a huge arcade, has yeah. now relocated. I had, the, I had the chance to go there twice. Unfortunately, by the time nice. I went to Japan with Strike First, the Kawasaki warehouse has since relocated. I have uh-huh. to do my research where the relocated new address is at. But mm. a lot of those Toraba crane machine that, that we were displaying mm-hmm. was there. And I wasn't even paying attention to those specifically. I was looking at other ones and I won some pretty damn good prizes, but never would have thought they would have had King of Fighter plush figurines. Yeah. I'm I'm shocked and trust me you guys, when um when I see more KOF stuff. I will let everybody know. So I, I always I appreciate Inosuke all your posts, fan. Kitty. So I'm an Inosuke fan, and I just had to have this one along with the Giyu. So they they come nicely wrapped up. I've never had a box beaten up or anything yet. I'm still expecting that blue ham ham that you saw that was one. I'm expecting that to come whenever it does. They're really good about shipping. It's a few weeks or less. That's always the case. And, you know, these plushies are really cute and detailed. And I rather try to risk, you know, a chance and win it on Toraba than pay triple the cost anywhere else I go. And, and let's be honest, that's what happens. So if you can't Don't be dumb. <laughs> and plus if you can't travel right now, we all don't know when conventions, anime cons or comic cons are coming back. This is a good placebo for everybody. I'm telling you, Toraba is great. <laughs> it's, it's fun. So I have a couple of uh, placebo, Japan placebos. Um, I'm always going to Tokyo Central, which out here in the States, they're now turning into Don Quixote's, which mm. is a godsend. Uh, there's one in like uh, Torrance area, Gardena area. It's a two-story one. And nice. I was able Mega to, donkey yeah, donkey. it's a giant one. And I was able to actually grab a uh, really pretty yukata for my birthday that's coming up. So I'm going to wear that in a photo shoot, cosplaying that a little Are bit. Are you selling Ichiran ramen there? I, um, 
I don't know if it's that one exactly, but they still have a giant food court and everything. And on the first floor, when you walk in, you go to one side, there's the food court and you go to the other side and that's like the, the main market entrance. And once you're going through in between those two entrances, you have the upstairs where you could just get your full on regular housewares all from Japan. You know, if you want the, uh, Kotatsu table or whatever, they have a bunch of them there. They have the nice big uh, covers for the tables and the chairs. So anytime, when you guys come down, trust me, we're going to do a lot of running around and shopping. Let's go. I'm ready. I need, so a, I need a road trip. We're going we're gonna to hit like seven book offs and we're just going <laughs> to constantly be going to the markets. Trust me. I have our whole schedules planned. Whenever I get to see you guys next, it's going to be a party. I already know where I'm going to take all of you. So no worries on that. But yes, Torba is great. You want to kill some time. All I say is to be safe and don't get too obsessed. Give yourself a weekly limit. Try $10, $15 a week or less. You really don't want to be blown like 60 bucks on one little Enosuke plushie or a We should, uh, we should post the number to Gamblers Anonymous while we're at it, too. <laughs> yeah, right? So, yeah. I'm not condoning gambling, but we all know how much fun crane games can be. And if you can't make it to round one and you can't travel anywhere, guess what? Download the Toraba app on your phone or your iPad and uh let me know if you win i want to i want to know if anybody wins big like me so awesome thank you nice you're very welcome very well said i will actually be looking more into the toraba and now you make me want to get a chizuru doll (laughs) i swear i don't know if they're gonna have any more of these because i think this was the last push on them but i i promise you i promise you I will if. find her on an auction somewhere. <laughs> oh, I will find her. She's very popular in the KOF series. Yes. On a side note. Pop up on Yahoo JP. You know. Right, something. exactly. Exactly. Or Rabbit Market or something like that. On a mm-hmm. side note, I really would like to have a figurine of, a, of Elizabeth Bren oh. from King, King of Fighters 11. Okay. She, was my, she was my vice replacement when vice wasn't in 11. So mm-hmm. King, Mai, and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was my team leader. Nice. So thank you. All right. So today on Mythological Moments, this time around, I'm going to cover the character Aya Brea from Parasite Eve. Mm. Yes. So as Squaresoft, Squaresoft is doing HD remakes of their games. Of course, Final Fantasy has had their HD remake. Uh, Silent Hill has had their HD remake. I believe Silent Hills by Capcom, if I'm correct. Mm-hmm. A yeah. lot of the horror, sci-fi, Konami. horror. Konami, thank Isn't you. Isn't it? I thought it was Capcom. Oh. So the sci-fi horror game genre is getting HD remakes. Resident Evil, Silent Hill. They look great. They look awesome in HD. But the one unique sci-fi game that has not had its shine yet is Parasite Eve. And so I wanted to go into the origins of who this woman was, because nobody tends to know who she is. This was the first game, and that mm-hmm. was the second game. We're not going to, for all intents and purposes, on, on respect to the fan community, we're not going to talk about the third game, the third birthday, which was rumored to be a cell phone game at one point, and then ended up being a PSP game, which was horrible and destroyed the franchise. So most of us Parasite Eve fans only like to talk about the first game and the second first game. Games. It's like The Godfather. <laughs> oh, it was great. <clears throat> hey, was I love The Godfather 3. <laughs> but it, it was a great game. So Parasite Eve was based upon the sci-fi novel, sci-fi horror novel, um, Hideki Sinna, who talks about uh, mitochondria Eve. So uh, to put it into proper perspective, a uh, husband scientist who's a husband who works at a university in Japan loses his wife and um, and daughter to a car crash. He became obsessed with losing his wife in a car crash that he decided to culture her liver cells for a project. The mitochondria cells and the liver 
becomes uh, overtakes the regular cells and becomes an entity of its own known as mitochondria Eve, who can self-replicate herself and create uh, photosynthesis and mutation within the human body. So simply put, in the nucleus of a cell, in every cell of the human body, there's over 100,000 cells in the human body, there's a nucleus, and within the nucleus is also the cytoplasm and also the mitochondria. Now, there is a specific relationship between the nucleus and the mitochondria, where the mitochondria gives off energy to the nucleus in exchange for oxygen. And there's a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship between the mitochondria and the nucleus of a single cell. And so by exchanging the energy and the oxygen between the two, that's how the cells live and die off. It's also rumored to be why we age mitochondria cells when cells take um, photos of itself throughout time, the photo becomes, and the duplication process between the photo becomes distorted, allowing cells to not replicate itself in the same way, which shows why our skin gets a certain way when we get old and our organs fail and why we don't live for thousands of years. So that's what the whole premise of this game is about. So Aya Brea, who's the main character right here, she is the main protagonist of Parasite Eve 1, which happens to be the sequel to the novel. Her story goes like this. Her and her sister Maya was in a car crash years ago back in New York with their mother. Her sister Maya died. Her mother died, but she survived. What she didn't know was that her sister and the mother were donors. And Maya ended up being the donor to another lady named Melissa Pierce, who ended up becoming this character right here, Eve. The cornea of Maya goes into Aya, and the kidneys of Maya go into Melissa Pierce, only to find out that years later, the cells were being manipulated by Dr. Hans Clamp, which is this man right here, who cultivates both the cornea and both the cells within the kidney. And however, the cells within the kidney mutate and become another form of mitochondria Eve, which is her in the first game. The cornea that's in Aya's eye, which was the transplant from her sister Maya, ends up becoming something different, which is why she's immune to Eve's powers in the game. Mm -hmm. As you play the game with Aya Brea, you dis she discovers her past over a series of five days on what truly happened to her sister Maya, how her sister was an organ donor along with the mother, but the mother's um, um, organs end up being bad, so it only was her sister Maya that was able to use her organs in order to save her and also another girl, Melissa Pierce, who becomes the opera singer in the first part of the game, who then sings and turns everybody on, on the stage and in the audience on fire by spontaneously connecting to their mitochondria cells and making everyone spontaneously combust. She goes on throughout the five days fighting all the hideous creatures that are created by mitochondria Eve, teaming up with her police partner, Daniel Bolas, right here, whose wife died at a concert due to Eve, and also teaming up with Japanese scientist um, Kuhikio Maeda, who also explains the entire mitochondrial process and what Eve is actually able to do just by looking at people and making them set on fire. It's got a new age Medusa. <laughs> oh yeah, she's oh yeah, she kind of looks like Hexadecimal from um, Reboot in a way. But a little bit, yeah. A little bit, right? right. <laughs> she, uh, this game is immensely deep as it talks about the science and the anatomy and physiology between cells, the inner workings of a cell and body parts and how they can mutate and what Eve is able to do to animals and humans alike. Mm. This is how Aya looks in Parasite Eve 2. And in Parasite Eve 2, after the defeat of Eve and the ultimate being, she goes on three years and moves to LA and becomes part of something called the Mitochondrial Investigation Suppression Team, 
team missed where she teams up with her teammate, um, Rupert, Jody Bouquet, and Mr. Carradine as they help her along in her mission to discover a governmental plot to create a new concept of transformable creatures by manufacturing neo-mitochondrial creatures by taking the older creatures that are left over from the incident of New York by the original Eve and combining them with viruses. So you get all these new creatures of mitochondrial mutations combined with viruses. And that's what Parasite Eve 2 is about. Along the way, she meets this guy named Kyle Madigan, who ends up becoming her boyfriend. And the series protagonist, number nine, right there, who she continuously fights throughout the way in Parasite Eve 2. The game became so popular throughout time, it became a cult classic and one of the best RPGs to own on the PlayStation 1. Mm -hmm. However, right here, which I'm going to put in full screen, this is an example of the fall of Eve in Parasite Eve 1. This is her end. This is Eve's final form when you fight her in the Statue of Liberty and you defeat her. Bye bye. Uh. <laughs> And then this is a scene of the rat mutation of what Eve is able to do to all the creatures that you encounter in Parasite Eve 1. This is a perfect example of the first rat mutation. And what's happening within the cells of the rat, how the mitochondrial takes over the entire host cell by self-replicating and creating the mutation process. They really missed out on making this a horror movie. Mm -hmm. Look well, at this. There were, there were talks about making the New York incident because this is the New York incident story, the game. They thought about making a live action version and it would have been awesome if they did. not Yeah, it would have. Just this rat alone. Because um, sure. I was always curious about playing Parasite Eve back then, but I never yeah. put my hands on it. So I'm glad I didn't because Resident Evil 2 scared the crap out of me and my friends yeah. when we play it late at night. So this, that rat would have given me so many nightmares. Oh, I'm glad and that's just day one. Game. That's <laughs> exactly. just day one of the story. There are other exactly. mutations with the other boss monsters that you will fight. There is a scene of what Eve looks like before that the death scene of what she looks like when you really fight her because you fight her in two forms. And mm -hmm. after you beat her first form, she transforms into that angel right there, that nude angel. And she mm -hmm. has this move where she goes up into the sky and creates a harpoon, an energetic harpoon, and she throws the missile to the center of the earth. So the closer you are to the harpoon, the bigger the damage. Mm. Yeah, it's... um. And to say that that FMV sequence is from PlayStation 1 and has aged well since 1998. Quite good. Yeah, Surprisingly, I was thinking the same thing. There's a lot of crappy stuff that you look at with red rose-tinted glasses nowadays, and it's like, man, some of that stuff is horrible. But that was pretty decent. So they had yeah. a nice forethought to make that artistically beautiful for generations to come. So good on them. Imagine, just imagine when Squaresoft one day decides to do the HD remake and finally adds the voice acting. Mm -hmm. uh, An HD remake. Um, that's, with, that's a, that, that, is, that will be that the moment where my phone also will be off and I will just be okay. streaming the game all day <laughs> and imitating and going in and running with the gun and going like this and shit. <laughs> Uh, We're gonna have to keep you away from uh, Cobatron's VR stuff if that makes it HD remix. I was just thinking that if they put dangerous. Parasite Eve in VR, it's <laughs> over with. Oh, yeah, now I have to buy a VR set. I'm gonna have to do everything you're doing. <laughs> exactly. 
So that uh, maybe it is. So that is uh, my mythological moments for this episode. You can find a used version of Parasite E for extremely cheap on eBay. You can also get the collector's guidebook. Unfortunately, right now, I do not have the collector's guidebook to show. I was such a fan of the series that I bought both the Japanese and the American versions of Parasite E 1 and 2. And I also own the two-part novel called Diva, which is mm. an intricate uh, telling of the New York incident and two graphic novels of Aya's adventure across Manhattan to track down Eve and to put a stop to her crazy mutations. Very nice. Very nice. All right. Moving on to the topic discussion for the group today is what were your favorite video game accessories of the 90s up to now? So we're going to go from the 90s up to now. What was your favorite video gaming accessories we are going to start with you cobra kai Tony. all right all right i had a, a a few items that you know that really stick out to me in the history of video gaming uh, as far as like peripherals and accessories um i went classic all the way back to nes and i thought about it and i was like hmm, could it be this could it be that but i thought about it and it's actually this. Let me show you what I am going to do. The Max. Okay. Oh, the Max. The Max. Yeah. Because, I mean, literally, look at this thing. It's got an analog stick. What, what is everything in video games now? Analog stick. This was the precursor to all that stuff. So That was this uh, is 20, 20 plus years before all the mainstream analog sticks came out. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean, you can get your your direction buttons on the side in the black, as you can see. But then that center, you can really get really smooth on on your uh, rotating around in circles and stuff. Real analog stick stuff, and has the turbo buttons, which is very important for video games on NES, like if you were playing track and field and stuff like that. So yep. this is this is one of the ones that stuck out to me. Uh, me and my brother, we had the NES Advantage, had the turbo and everything too, the joystick, but just the analog stick on this really just stuck out to me. I'm like, on how things are today. So Turbo buttons. Turbo buttons was like a big thing. I think they were like the first to really put out turbo buttons in the mainstream where you seen that advertisement and it was like, are you saying I don't really got to do this anymore? Mm-hmm. I could just do <laughs> this and it'd be the <laughs> same thing. So that was like a big draw for this and the NES Advantage at the time. It was, especially for the sports games, like uh, California games. Well, oh, you yeah. really had to like for the track and field had to do like that. Now the turbo, you just press the turbo button and just hold it. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to, you know, hurt your wrist in the process trying to do that. <laughs> yeah. So that 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 one was the one for me. I like the uh, how the features of it today are used heavily, and it is what makes video game controllers relevant now. The analog stick. Yeah. Okay. All right, and Kitty? Okay, so I have a couple because I can never decide. I could talk about oh, gaming right. accessories that's like one of the, forever. That's one of Cookie's hardest ones so far. Like, definitely yeah, can't this, think of one. This, this one was tough. And so I'll go with my first favorite one, which is the Game Boy Fanny Pack, which is now cool to wear again. But <laughs> you, you can't beat that black with hot pink. I have my original Game Boy Fanny Pack. I was so sad that I couldn't find it in the museum slash treasure uh, trove that is my (laughs) parents' house. But trust me, it is there somewhere with my Game Boy in it and all my games still. But the Game Boy Fanny Pack was really great because, I mean, it's just kind of from that step from the 80s into the 90s where we still kept Fanny Packs around. And it, it wasn't a fashion faux pas yet and again i always brought mine everywhere we went all family trips and when we did take long family trips and i know newer generations don't know this struggle but trust me it was a struggle and i know you guys can relate to this you needed a light in order to play your original game boy Mm -hmm. Or you just couldn't see in the dark. And Mm -mm. this is my favorite accessory because this thing was like 
a religious always had to have it on me type of accessory for my Game Boy. This was the nubby game light, which was better than the official Game Boy game light. Is it nubby? I've I always called it newbie. <laughs> I've, I've, I, I go newbie, nubby, whatever, back and forth. But this light was so much better than the official Game Boy light that came out because it just latched on to the top. Mm. And you didn't have the negative space with the awkward magnifier, you know, lens on the top. And there would always be some kind of awkward in-between glare from other lights like reflecting in. But with this light... You were able to just have it right on top. I always had like a pack of batteries if we went on a vacation or something. Always had those rechargeable batteries. Thanks, Dad, for helping me discover those. Those helped with all the (laughs) portable gaming systems throughout life. Rechargeable batteries were a godsend. But Mm -hmm. always had those. Had this and my Game Boy in the fanny pack. And I will forever just like hold on to those memories. This was one of my favorite, favorite accessories of all time. I got so much use and functionality out of it. It was great. So I I really enjoy this one. I even thought it was better than the Game Boy Advance light, which was just a dinky little light on a, on a squiggly little bendable looking wire. I was hoping they would. Glow worm. They call those things the glow worms back. Yes. This one looked like worms because they were all squiggly. Like. And the light went everywhere. It didn't focus just down on yeah. the screen. It went everywhere. The diffuser on it like made the light shine all the way past the screen. Mm-hmm. Like worthless. It, it <laughs> I had really to make was. my own. I think I it talked really about was. it on the show before, but made that thing. <laughs> that thing was cool. But this one, I think, was one of the best light accessories for any handheld throughout the years of Game Boy. So I will always sing the praises of this light for the old school Game Boy and the fanny pack. Then my last accessory that I love to death is the PlayStation Game Shark. And I could not play my, um, I had a chip PlayStation and I wanted to play all my DDR games. I wanted to get good at them so I could show off next time I went to James Games or Gameworks and didn't have to wait forever in line to practice. So went to, I don't know if you guys know this, but there used to be an awesome store um, near DeWarty. It was called, um, in between DeWarty and Arcadia, it was called Game Cave. And that's Mm. where I saw some of the coolest Capcom figures. I'll go into that later. Rare Gems, the first Sailor Moon fighting game I ever laid my eyes on, saw there. But I went over there, bought DDR Fourth Mix, Japanese version because that's all they had. And I purchased the Game Shark so I could play that game. And I can't tell you how many DDR dance pads I went through, but <laughs> it, I, I, got, I got some good times. Um, you said fourth party. mix? Yes. It was all about make your move. <laughs> nice. That was and the song. That was that was one of my favorites. Um, you know me; it was all the smile DK goodness for me. So <laughs> I, I think um, my dad could not take Pink Dinosaur one more time. I feel so bad for my family because I would just tape two dance pads together, stick them down, tape them to the ground with duct tape. And just do like the two person to pink dinosaur, so I could do like flashy spins and moves. Oh my god! Oh my I, god! I, Kitty's, I, Kitty's parents, whole so thing sorry. is pretty much what I was going to talk about too. So <laughs> it's going to lead into my stuff, but I, go, I know all about it. putting on putting the laminated laminated plastic up on top of your uh, your oh, cloth pads, and and I even those even will break because you're stomping on those. And it's like the it's kind of like a like a really brittle thin plastic and eventually you get cracks on those and then all of a sudden the arrows aren't connected you're like you hit an arrow over here and it, mm-hmm. damn, those were the days man but right yep. i i won't lie i think um a mix between ddr and pata pata constantly for t- over 10 plus years in the arcades i think that's why i'm still skinny like I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. Video games, oh. they they help in so many ways. Like we don't even think about it, and I swear by that. Like play play pata pata, play DDR. You'll always stay in shape. No worries. 
<laughs> now they have Ring Fit Adventure. I don't know if you guys know about this. It's this thing you hook up to your switch, yep. and it's like this exercise thing, and it's a ring, and you squeeze it, and it has tension, and you can pull it apart, and it has tension, and it's supposed to, like, drill down on your core. But basically, uh, I have uh. that, too, and that's pretty sick, but it all pretty much started with, like, the Wii Fit games and the Wii Balance Board and the little Wii Tracker. I want to say that little tracker kept me yeah. in check. I kept it with me it, outside of the game. It's one of those things. It's a game outside of the game. I bring it with me. It tells me you need to stand up and walk. And it kind of, I, I must commend Nintendo for stuff like that because a lot, a lot of people might just kind of let themselves go and might need a little reminder. You know, they have Wii uh, Fitbits and all that stuff nowadays, but I feel like Nintendo is one of the people pushing that forward early. So much props to them for that. You know what? Like, I got to give you uh, props on that, too, because we wouldn't probably have our DDR dance pads if it wasn't for the old school Olympic Nintendo games pad. Track and field. Like, once again, like like, uh, Tone was saying, you know, with the analog stick, they were way ahead of the future. Honestly, they've been way ahead of the future for a bunch of accessories and and i agree on that controller with the analog as much as i do saying they've pretty much pioneered and paved the way for those dance pads too well nintendo had always agreed that whenever they decide to put out a game it will have what they call their seal of quality and if Mm -hmm. it doesn't have the golden seal that means it's not from nintendo nintendo has always been family oriented so they want to promote family togetherness through adventure platforms Oh, yeah. Family and health, adventure and thinking. So you had some pretty good games back in the day that were fun. The fun adventure games were Qbert and Mario and Mm Pac-Man and Kirby. And the puzzle games were Alleyway, the the Adventures of Lolo and Tetris. And then you had the the sports games like California Games and the the tracking, the running tracking game and the, the tennis. So they had something for every specific genre, and they wouldn't release it until all the bugs was out, until it reached a particular standard of quality that they knew would bring people together. Not nice. only that, I appreciated on um, the Wii Fit and the Wii Fit Plus, mm-hmm. you could put your pets on the board. Yeah. <laughs> I have all of my pets. I have Humphrey and Ella on the Wii still, because you could actually measure their you could their track, their, you could track their little with. steps yep. too like you, yep and they that. get yeah. like a little paw print on their calendar and everything is the cutest <laughs> stuff you're just making little avatars of them yeah i've i've always appreciated those little touches that they've done cool well moving forward i'm going to present my little my favorite accessories that i enjoyed over time i'm going to pull up my little images right here. So the first one is this. Oh. Yes. Tuner. I loved that Game Gear tuner. (laughs) When Color TV first came out, all for the Game Gear, it was, this was one of the best selling staples. And there is AV input and outputs on the tuner, if you can see right Mm -hmm. here and right here. So you can actually use the Game Gear screen to play PS1 or PS2 if you hook it up right. There are YouTube videos on that for the cheap man's solution on using a side screen to play your retro consoles on the go, but you don't want to buy a TV. You can use the Game Gear and route it through the TV tuner, and this will be playing PlayStation 1 games. (laughs) That's cool. So, yes, TV tuner. Moving forward. So this is the most rarest Saturn in creation. It's known as the Hitachi Navi Saturn because it was made to be played in Japanese vehicles. This screen is what I'm referencing here where you can play the Sega Saturn on the go. It is literally the first major full set console that you can play on the go with a screen attached. And it came with a specific power brick that will hook into your car's cigarette lighter so you can pull juice from the battery (laughs) and play Sega Saturn in the car on the go. That's awesome. With this screen right there. (laughs) And it's known as the Hitachi Navi Saturn. 
very hard to get your hands on this version of the Saturn because this version also has the built-in VCD card that allowed you to play VCDs. Also has uh, two karaoke ports, one right here and one right here. So you could also do karaoke through VCD. Wow. Yes. The most is also known as one of the most holy grail collective item items in console collectors history. I'll How big that. is that screen? How big was that screen? It was like a it's four like by four, four and a half. Four okay. by four. It, it really wasn't all that special. But for the time, it was paramount. Right now, nobody wouldn't dare. That's like the size of a Game Boy black and white screen right there. Pretty much. So, But back then, it was the rage. It was everything. It was like we could play this heavy console on the go and sing karaoke <laughs> and watch VCD movies. You could do everything because everything was built in. And this version of the Saturn also has built-in extra RAM, so you didn't need the RAM cart right there yeah. if you wanted to. It's like Street choice. Fighter. Yeah. How much, how much would one of those things go for, Cookie, if you found one? Right now, with the box and everything, you'll be lucky if you get it for 1500 But with all, with all the accessories, with all the oh, accessories man. and everything, because there's more, there's also a karaoke deck port that has like uh, seven different um, echoes that you can tune in with the bass and treble. Oh, wow. Uh, all of that put together, you're looking at a mass of $3,000 for the entire kit and caboodle now, because it's rare. They're very rare and working wow. too, 3000 Just the machine by itself with two controllers, no screen, will range about a thousand bucks. Oof, oof, oof. But I'm just going to stick to saving my money for the uh, Neo Geo MVS cab. But oh. <laughs> I wish I wish you the best of luck finding this unicorn. Of oh, I, I found I found the unicorn. It's just finding the unicorn with all its body parts. Mm. Yes. That's all. Um, the Neo Geo Pocket Color Link Cable from Pocket Color to Dreamcast mm -hmm. was one of my favorite accessories. Yes. This link cable not only marked the first generation of sharing data between a handheld console and a full-fledged console. You can share all kind of information between the Neo Geo Pocket Color games and other Neo Geo CD games that were ported to the Dreamcast, such as a 99 Dream Match, mm -hmm. which was the Slugfest 98, basically. And uh, that... 99 oh. Evolution and some other games. And that's the one we need to unlock what we were talking about with uh, CVS, huh? Yes, so we, so we need, we need a, um, Capcom versus SNK 1 um, for Dreamcast. And mm -hmm. we need Card Clash Fighters Capcom side and Card Clash Fighters SNK, SNK side. side. Mm -hmm. yes. And collect all 600 cards. So there's 300 mm -hmm. cards in Capcom. 300 cards in SNK, 600 cards in total, and port that information from the Neo Geo Pocket Color into CVS1 Dreamcast. Then it unlocks everyone that it's we were talking about, right? The secret characters in Match of the Millennium for Neo Geo yes. Pocket Color, which the game just got licensed to be on the Nintendo Switch which, um, yes. this April. Yep which I will stream. I will stream because I love the DDR mini game with Felicia known as Catwalk. Yes. yes. That was like the best game besides yes. Mars people, <laughs> shooting Mars people and Haolmaru and Jubei slashing uh, practice uh, Samurai Hey people. God, yes. those games were so great. Oh, I'm, I'm going to turn on my Neo Pocket and play them. I love those. It's sad. There. It's sad that the that the rivalry and the dialogue was better in the pocket version than it was in the actual arcade game. So <laughs> I like it. I like it. All I so. hear is uh, Karen just saying "buck up, loser." Uh, I don't know why that was like the line I remember the most when when <laughs> you would lose at these mini games, but she would always say that. It's cool that they made her the ambassador for the Capcom Olympics and Remy Ruru the ambassador for the SNK Olympics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We should run a CVS tournament. We should do that. 
That's you should point. do it. You should do it during the Olympics and tie all of that in together. Yeah. That so, this, cool. so this piece right here is the VCD mechanism brick that you can hook onto the back of your vanilla PlayStation One original fat version, and there's the power switch, and it would allow you to play VCDs on a PS One, which it was PS One's answer to Sega Saturn's VCD card. Mm. Yes. And then last but not least, let's oh, I remember that. <laughs> I remember the, that. The Interactor. Um, this, <laughs> this device was supposed to be great. It was supposed to allow us to feel everything that we're playing in games, specifically at the time, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, Street Fighter 2, Killer Instinct. Mm -hmm. You so we were supposed to feel Contra, Double Dragon. It was tailored for platform fighting games and one-on-one -on -one fighting games. You're supposed to feel all the hits and the jerks and make you feel like you're in a game. It didn't make me feel shit back then or now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you imagine that at one point someone thought it was a good idea to make us feel like human rumble packs? You that know, I... <laughs> They were trying. They were trying to make immerse us, but that 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 thing right there was just as useless as the, the Game Boy Black and White printer accessory. Oh, that thing was fun. Printing out receipts of pixelated pictures like a dot matrix printer. It was awful. <laughs> awful. And then my last accessory is this, which I actually own this. This is the um, Wii U pin. Yeah. And this pen um, lights up many different colors. Um, it goes from green, blue, brown, everything. I guess my pen right now doesn't want to work. I was trying to show the pen because I have it in my hand right now. This is the pen and the stand. And it lights up many different ways. I guess the battery must have went dead. But What would you mostly use it for? Like what game or thing would you play with that you know what to be honest i don't know i got this <laughs> pen like i got the pen as a package deal when i wanted a wii u set when somebody was selling it um at an auction with bayonetta 2 and that was my my that was my way to get bayonetta 2 bayonetta so 2 bayonetta in general makes you do crazy things so it did so and it was cheap. It was a cheap package deal. It came with three games. One of them was Bayonetta 2. I forget about what the other two games were because at the time it didn't matter, except for Bayonetta 2. It came with the, the tablet. I got the Wii U tablet back there. Mm -hmm. It came with one um pro controller and it came with this pin, which I mean looks like a disco lighted disco. So it just starts fucking flickering and shit. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I got all of that for a hundred and fifty dollars. That's not bad. I'm and curious to know what you could play with it, though. Yeah, we, we gotta we gotta play with it. You gotta let us know. I mean, I'm curious. There's no there's no Mario Paint for that. Gen, I was just so. gonna ask that. I was just gonna ask that. Can do. I don't think there was ever a Mario Paint app on the Wii U, but it it's got to be something cool you could do. And it said, I don't even know how to open the thing because I, I'm so used to it. Just I press the button and it goes green and blue and red and white and gold. And then you can press the button a couple of times and it just starts going like this. And it's cool. And, and you just write on the tablet. And it was just a cool accessory. And I, I never used it. I just had it for show. It would show people when they come over and they'd be like, well, what are you going to do with it? I'm like, I have no uses for it. I'm like, the only one game I have outside of that is this game called Palladians or something. And uh, you put these carriages on a mount and it hooks into the Wii U and it syncs with the carriages magnetically. It was the first Amiibos. Mm. Um, Skylanders. That was the name of the game. Skylanders. Oh, that. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Okay. And I have, mm. the one, I have the one ninja girl that's holding two Xena chakrams in her hand. Because I thought it was cool. I haven't even played that game, but I have the figurines. Skylanders is cool. I won't even say was cool. It is cool till this day, even though it's dead. 
it, it was very sudden on how it died. It was the same with the the Disney version of it. Well, what Skylanders was, it? was going Infinity against Disney and yes, Nintendo, yes. and you know, it's like, but Activision kind of did it smart, and Skylanders was not that bad going against mm-hmm. Disney and Nintendo Amiibo. So, yep, that's why I say they are cool. So. If you guys want to know something funny, when I was at Book Off last week, the accessory that Cookie was showing, that whole make yourself a rumble pack, it's at Book Off for $40. Just putting <laughs> it out there. Just letting you guys know. If you Go to if Book you want, Off if you if want, you want you one want. in box, if you want one in box, it's over there. So <laughs> just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Big difference from from that fifteen hundred dollar Hitachi Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! Right. Oh yeah! Oh man! All I know is I can't wait to go to Cookies and start playing with everything and see what that pen does. It's like a hidden trove. I'm gonna find out all the things what that pen does. Unlock some hidden Mario paint somewhere. I don't know. Well, accordingly, it's one of those, I, one of I those guess escape I... room items you need, like. Bring it with you. Like, how do I get out of this room? This you need the Wii U pen to escape the room. Well, it seems like I just finally opened the pin and the <gasps> battery. The, the, well, this is how you open it to get to the battery. And uh, um, I guess it uh, got corroded. The battery got corroded. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I got to I gotta, I gotta, I gotta clean it out. Corrosion. <laughs> I got to well, clean Wiimotes, it out and put it in the Check all your old Wiimotes. You might be corroding right now and not even know it. Take oh. all the batteries always out of the electronics. Oh, yeah, that's that's a that's a given. But, you know, I never really thought about the pin like that. So, well, oh, well. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't even think a battery was in there. I just already figured that it just recharged on the stand. Right. That's- yeah, and, so. and, and this is just and this is just a mount. It's it's not a recharging stand. It's just a mount. Okay. So. Mm. Yeah, to keep to keep the I guess to keep the the, the pin tip part from I guess getting dull or whatever mm-hmm. the stylus from getting screwed up. And then you know all the bayonetta fans will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, how are we gonna use this for bayonetta? We're gonna scribble everything out, <laughs> but scribble your movements cool. on the screen. So. Could do scribble knots. So, well, anywho, <laughs> anybody got any closing um comments they want to say or anything they want to share? I uh, just want to mm-hmm. thank everybody who uh who came in on our Twitch uh, Team Strike vs Twitch and uh viewed our Virtual Fighter tournament, our Civil Wars, and we will be coming with more games to you. Maybe CVS, CVS two, maybe Alpha. Maybe some old school championship edition. You never know. Stay tuned. And where can we where can we find the Strike First uh, Twitch channel at? Oh, at Team Strike One ST. Team Strike First. Team Strike One ST. And from what I understand, there's always something going on almost every day on the channel. So stay oh, yes. tuned. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. So thank you for joining us for the Strike First Gaming Show. I'm your host, Fosun Elizabeth Cookie. And we will see you again in the next two weeks with episode five. Woo! Episode five. Next next week.